Hi students, so welcome to our next um, unit of study for AP Euro, uh, specifically this one is going to be the Industrial Revolution. And what you need to understand once again is that revolution means change. In this case we're talking about a change in the way of industrial uh, ways that the industry is going to change. Um, and when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, we mostly focus on England. Uh, England is going to be this first place in, in Europe that is going to industrialize. Um, and there's some factors that's going to lead into why specifically England and why the Industrial Revolution is going to be happening. Uh, something to keep in mind is that there's also an agricultural revolution. Once again, revolution means change, uh, specifically in England. And a lot of it has to come uh, with this enclosure movement that's going to occur. And by enclosure movement, what they're doing is pretty much they're fencing around areas that used to be medieval farms. And who this is benefiting is going to be the rich landowners. A lot of them that are going to be parliament owners. And you're going to see why that's going to be so um, influential later when we talk about a parliament. And when you have, um, you know, this enclosure uh, movement, um, it starts to get you your land, your labor, your capital, and now your markets in order to industrialize correctly and, su and successfully in the Industrial Revolution. Now, there's going to be um, a, quite a few results that comes from this enclosure movement, and one of the major ones is going to be a population boom. And why this is so important, this population boom, is because now you're going to have workers to work in the factory. In fact, a lot of these small landowners um, before this enclosure movement start moving into the cities and become your factory uh, workers. So there's also going to be family changes where now people are marrying because they start loving each other. And with this population boom, you're going to see that the illegitimate children, that's now going to be on a rise as well as people are engaging themselves. And you can kind of paint the picture with that one. Uh, there's going to be more consumer changes as things are going on, that people are going to be more willing to buy things. And during this industrial revolution, uh, when people continue to work, um, in this mass production type of way, it's going to make these goods and services to be cheaper. Um, you know, and there's, and when these things are going to be more cheaper and people more willing to buy them, then other things are going to be made as well, like new leisure items. So there's going to be more demand for new items that are going to be coming in here. Now, cities are going to grow. You're going to have massive um, urban development, in which case a lot of these cities are going to be redesigned. And that kind of comes in uh, with this thing called the Chadwick Report during the um, 1842, in which then he realized, wow, these cities are so disgusting because everyone is moving there. We need to do something and clean up this these cities. So this is going to be one of these results of the Industrial Revolution when it comes to the city planning uh, that is going to be um, occurring at this time. And one of the first items that are going to be built in these um, factories, uh, so to speak, is going to be textiles, um, cloth. Uh, those are going to be the items that are going to be made. Now, other things that are going to be occurring during this Industrial Revolution in order to make things better is going to be technology. Technology is going, these innovations and in technology is really going to help um, move this Industrial Revolution along. Um, why, though, is England going to be the main one? Um, well, there's going to be a lot of different reasons. First off, in England, they have a stable government. When we're talking about the 1800s, Europe is in shambles. Um, most of Europe has been fighting uh, the Napoleonic Wars for the first 15 you know, years or so of the 19th century. Okay, the French Revolution is happening. A lot of liberalism is being spread and nationalism is going to be spread. And I'll go into the isms a little bit later uh, in this video. So you're starting to see these movements of people uh, trying to go against um, the current governments. Uh, England also had access to a lot of coal. Uh, they already had canal systems. They already had a network of roads um, already ready. So England was kind of very much primed uh, to get this going. 
Prussia will follow. Okay, so don't get me wrong. Prussia is going to follow um, along, you know, in the footsteps of England, um, not to the same extent that England is going to have, but they will, you know, start to industrialize these German states. France, on the other hand, does not industrialize, industrialize as fast because of the instability of everything that's already happening within that country. Talking about the French Revolution, talking about Napoleon. Um, so that's why France does not industrialize as fast. Um, issues in Southern and Eastern Europe is going to be uh, with serfdom and not being able to have the natural resources um, you know, that is going to be prevalent that we saw in England. And like we said, England is starting this technology movement. Uh, you have James Watt with the steam engine, okay? So you have energy sources. They have fossil fuels. Now remember, not everyone is going to be for these new technology, okay? Um, in fact, a lot of people are saying that new technology and science is going to be bad. In fact, your romantics, and I'll get into romanticism, like I said later when we do the isms, they are very much, you know, not exactly focused on science, and they see some of the issues that science and scientists can have thinking that science may take them uh, so far. In fact, there was a group of individuals, some people may call them a terrorist group, called the Luddites. And the Luddites would go into these factories that they saw new technology and they would actually destroy um, these te technological uh, aspects. So don't think that everybody in England and everyone in Europe is like, yes, the Industrial Revolution, let's get this going, new technology, yes. Okay, so just keep that in mind that that is going to be an issue. So let's talk about the results of the Industrial Revolution. Now we know that there's going to be increased production, which then is going to have a decrease in prices so more people could you know, afford things. That's great. But let's look at some of these other things. Okay, uh, there's going to be something called the Sadler Commission. And the Sadler Commission actually went in and said that a lot of these working um, factories were in horrible conditions and the working conditions for these people were absolutely horrible. So the Sadler Commission's goal was to try to help improve workers to make sure that they were actually, um, you know, in better working environments. Uh, you're going to start to see that there's going to be different laws that are going to be passed. One of these first laws is going to be the Corn Laws in 1815. Um, and these Corn Laws actually raised prices on foreign goods so then people would be more willing to buy homemade British goods with this enclosure movement, which is going to be the parliament and landowners who already have this making more money. So you're going to start to see protest uh, come down the line based upon these corn laws, okay? Uh, there's going to be the Factory Acts, okay? And the Factory Act and the Miners Act of 1842, they're going to start to limit um, children and women from working, um, you know, either long hours or just banning them completely from working in the mines, for example. Um, all of these new reforms even goes into a reform uh, bill or reform act in which um, they were trying to get more suffrage for men so that more people can vote uh, you know, for elections. So just because that we see that these working class individuals aren't exactly getting you know, the best working conditions, there are slow and steady steps to have more universal suffrage uh, in England. In fact, um, like we said, there's a group called the Chartist Movement in which they wanted universal suffrage. One man, one vote. Now, it doesn't exactly work that way at this time, but that was something that they were trying to do. Um, so you're going to start to also have gender issues. Okay, the very, very rich elite, women believed in this thing called the cult of domesticity. It wasn't just women, it was also, you know, the men... And it wasn't all women, so don't get me wrong on that. And this cult of domesticity was uh, dis um, discussing about how women's role is at the home with, 
you know, cooking, cleaning, and whatnot. But the thing was is that a lot of the rich women would have servants. So these rich women didn't think that there was, you know, why would I want women's rights for when I have servants? So a lot of this feminist movement is going to be your um, poorer classes and some of your middle classes that are cooking and cleaning and whatnot and not seeing any of the benefits of, um, you know, the fruits of their labor. And then also you're talking about, you know, gender once again and social classes. All of your poor women are working. And you are going to see a gap wealth with these social classes. You're going to see that the lowest 80% of England, okay, only has 40% of the wealth. So you're going to see that a social, you know, class system, this gap system uh, is going to be occurring um, at this time. There's going to be new uh, ways of thinking, a lot of new theorists uh, that are going to come out of the woodwork here. And one of the most influential people during this industrial age is a guy named Thomas Mathis. And Thomas Mathis um, looked into and studied uh, the population boom uh, that was occurring during this industrial revolution. And during this industrial age, Thomas Math Mathis said that there's going to be a point in which the population is going to be over, or at least the earth's going to be overpopulated, and there will not be enough food, and there won't be enough resources, and then eventually everyone is going to die. Uh, you know, he definitely saw how England's population had doubled within, you know, a few decades to a point where it was going to be alarming in the way that the rest of the earth couldn't be able to keep up. Obviously now today there's been a lot of people that use Thomas Mathis for you know overpopulation and how are the natural resources are going to be dwindling over time. So Thomas Mathis was definitely you know 200 years before where a lot of people are kind of going with this today. Uh, kind of leads into, if we're going to be talking about population, David Ricardo and his Iron Law of Wages. And what David Ricardo had suggested is that when population um, or when labor is in demand, um, wages go up. And when you have more wages, population is going to go up because you're more willing to have a family. But then when the population goes up and labor is not so much in demand because there's more people that are going to be involved, uh, wages are going to start to go down. And when you have less wages, then you're going to have uh, less population um, because you're not going to be able to afford that family. So he kept on saying that there was going to be a cycle with population, which kind of leads into math as that why you were seeing a boom at that time. But Ricardo had suggested that the population of you know, the world, or specifically in England in this case, would eventually go down once these lower wages would kick in and that people would not be willing uh, to have a family. Um, Adam Smith is another one of these theorists at this time. Even though we talk about him in the Enlightenment, he still, his capitalism ideas and self-wealth does connect very well with the Industrial Revolution. Jeremy Bentham with his utilitarianism, okay, and what it pretty much was is that um, sometimes you have to do what's the greater good for the most people. So even though it may not be as popular as maybe something else, it still has to be what's good for everyone else. That's what you have to do which kind of leads into um, a few utopian uh, types of people like Robert Owen, okay? And Robert Owen um, pretty much said, if you want to make your workers happy, what you have to do is create humane working conditions. And if these people are happy, they're actually going to produce better uh, products. There's not gonna be any strikes and you're going to be actually making more of a profit. Um, this is going to be differing a little bit uh, with some of your French uh, socialism, like Conte de Saint-Simon, who was one of your first French founders of socialism, and pretty much what he was kind of talking about um, is that there's definitely a public um, criticisms of 
you know, these working groups and that they needed to get um, a little bit better, you know, working conditions. And Louis Blanc, very, very similar, and he kind of fought for universal suffrage. But when we're talking about socialism and communism, the main person we always think about is the German Karl Marx with the Communist Manifesto, in which he said that the working class needed to unite and rebel against, you know, the bourgeois factory owners. And that would be the only way that these workers would actually ever achieve any sort of equality within European society. Now, during this age of industrialization and the um, the industrial revolution, so to speak, there's going to be six different ways of thinking, and we call them the isms. There's liberalism, and the whole point of liberalism uh, is the idea of trying to eliminate um, a monarch or trying to move away from a central authoritative figure. Now, with that in mind, though, um, the objective behind it was trying to give everybody rights. That's not entirely true. It was mostly talking about the middle class trying to get more voting rights. And it kind of stopped um, just at men. So women also are not going to get any really any rights at all with this ism. So keep that in mind that liberalism, as we kind of think about it today, is kind of trying to give everyone, you know, civil rights or some sort of voting rights. No, it's just mostly your upper middle class, the bourgeois in this case. Um, those are, at least that would be the group that we're going to be specifically talking about with liberalism. Now, conservatism, uh, this idea that we had talked about with the Congress of Vienna, uh, from the last unit with Metternich, this conservative group is talking specifically about keeping everything, the status quo, um, monarchs, central authoritative figures. They were afraid of liberalism, mostly because of what they saw with the French Revolution. They saw that, you know, the people rising up and removing central authoritative figures. So in this case, conservatism is going to be mostly linked with keeping the old traditions of monarchs. Um, now, feminism is going to start, and um, some of your main individuals uh, kind of linked with feminism, uh, we had talked about in earlier units. Um, Olympia de Georges, who writes the Declaration of the Rights of Women during the French Revolution, and Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, another individual is going to be John Stuart Mill, who's also a liberal, but you know he is very influenced about feminism, uh, mostly because of his wife that kind of starts to spur these ideas for him. So feminism is talking about granting women um, equal voting rights and equal working rights. Um, another one is nationalism. And the idea of nationalism is going to play a big part when we get into World War I because of imperialism. But nationalism is focusing on granting independence or independent movements. It's going to create a lot of these revolutions uh, in the 1800s, that's going to be the next unit or the next video that I will be making these revolutions of the mid 1800s, later 1800s. But um, but nationalism is just talking about you know a love for one's country or um, a love for one's ethnic group to a point where they want to create their own country. And like I said, nationalism, uh, conservatives conservatives are going to be worried about nationalistic movements because it's going to possibly upheave the uh, monarchs that are already in place. Then you have socialism. And socialism is one that we kind of already know. It's about these working uh, groups, these working class that's going to rise up against the bourgeois and this upper class in order to create equal, um, you know, for everyone talking a lot about money. Uh, they do believe that, you know, this bourgeois group is pretty much slave owners. And our last one is romanticism. And romanticism was going to be a new style of writing. And the thing is, is, though, it doesn't go with a lot of these liberal movements that are happening. In fact, romanticism kind of goes against even the moderns of science. Uh, they say that science is going to take us too far to a point of no return, creating, you know, monsters, uh, so to speak. One of the most um, influential romantic pieces is Frankenstein by uh, Mary Shelley. 
So this is a change of kind of ideas. Now, um, romantic pictures are going to be like landscapes and whatnot. It's going to be different from Baroque and even different from Rococo. And Rococo was during this Enlightenment movement where it's like the wispiness, uh, mostly showing off um, modern day things of rich people and rich nobles of what they would be doing on an everyday basis where then romanticism is just focusing on let's go back to the good old days of nature and um, those backgrounds so I just wanted to say thank you very much for kind of uh, listening to and watching this whole entire video about the Industrial Revolution. I really hope that you learned a lot. Please make sure that you know you subscribe, you like, give me a thumbs up if you think I'm doing a good job of trying to get uh, this AP Euro group ready to go for this uh, you know, AP test that's coming up, especially under whatever conditions that you are going through right now. Um, please also take a look at the other review um, videos that I have going. Uh, we're going to keep it up. So thank you for watching and I hope that you get a five on that test.